you know, if we flew in and an aircraft was down, their job was to go out and destroy the aircraft, destroy any equipment that was there and bring back any survivors, which there never were any survivors. But yeah, you're right. That is the first time that uh, that I was actually faced with anything like that. And, and you always wonder how you react. But I tell you, especially because I was so new, uh, you, you're scared to death. You're going to forget something, you know, obviously with three people being dead and uh, and the uh, the suspect standing there holding a gun when you show up, uh, you want to do everything right because, you know, people's families are involved. You, you don't want to miss something up. So so you're so concentrating on, you know, making sure you take photographs of everything, making sure people stand back out of the crime area uh, and. And it had happened like maybe 20 minutes before I got there. So, so there were probably close to a hundred people standing around. So, so there's just so much to think about that. You don't really think about that till later on, you know, way after the case is over with and you start thinking about, you know, the impact that that has on, on the individuals that were involved. Welcome to Game of Crimes. Yo, everybody, welcome. Players, playerettes, dudes, dudettes, amigos, amigas, everybody in between, welcome back. This shall be called episode 57 of the original unadulterated Game of Crimes. I am Morgan Wright, the unofficial brand ambassador for Tommy Bahama here <laughs> with my cheap bastard partner in crime. Free t-shirt wearing Steve Murphy, but you can call me Murph. Yes, 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 man. We have just had a... Uh, been a hell of a travel week um <laughs> i was telling murph uh traveling to see family is one thing taking almost 24 hours to get back is another with weather delays so my astra's dragging so bad i had band-aids on the bottom of my buttocks uh -huh. um so i could survive it was but anyway but you know what we are pumped we are we don't want to nobody cares about that all they care about is what's coming up next so yep. thank you for joining us dash small talk oh wait, there i am reading from the prompter again uh just like ron burgundy and somebody else somebody else did that recently so <laughs> wake up hey, wake up just some quick housekeeping for you guys apple reviews five stars and spotify just go on over there it helps really helps us out a lot guys and we really we value your opinions we love those so please Hit those things up. Let us know what you think. Head on over to our website, gameofcrimespodcast.com. We've got books there. We've got merch there. We've got uh, the episodes. We have pictures. We always put pictures there. Um, our mailing list. So head on over there because it drives up traffic and it makes it look like, hey, we're popular guys because mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we want to be the popular people in school. <laughs> By the way, follow us on social media, right? At Game of Crimes on Twitter, at Game of Crimes Podcast on Facebook and the Instagram. But where you got to be, Steve? Where you got to be, Steve? Where you got to be, Steve? Uh, I got to be at the restaurant here in a little while for lunch, but uh, oh, oh, you're talking about Patreon oh, the food special? That's right, right? Patreon? No, that's later this evening, four o'clock this afternoon. You don't want to be late because those old people will shove you away from the buffet every time. Uh, <laughs> hey, no, join us on Patreon because we got so much cool stuff on there. You think 57 episodes is a lot? I'm, I'm, I love it when you say it. Episode 57, we've got 57 shows out there. But wait till you see what's on Patreon. I, we've got more stuff on there than we do our regular ep episode list. Oh, and we, and we just did some stuff. We did the Q&A we did that just came out for, for July 10th is extensive. One of the longest Q&As we've done. A yeah. lot of great questions from people. Um, and we answer everything. It's Ask Us Anything. We, we try and answer everything we can. Uh, we love doing that stuff. And guess what? We just released. Guess what we just released, Steve? What did we just release? Huh? 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 Well, we just released Chris and Dave's story about the Cali cartel. And this is fantastic. You got to get over and listen to this. You're going to learn so many things. I, I knew about the case and I learned so much from these guys. It's only 16 hours of content, just so you know. Just so you know, it's the real DA Narcos talking about the real DA Narcos Cali edition, and you can only find that. We have three levels, but you can only find it at the Guardian of the Realm, Warden of the Throne level. So go to patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. Hit us up, find out all the great content, because we've got great stuff coming up this month. Everything from our 911, uh, you know, um, a who shot who? Oh no, that's that's what we used to answer nine one one nine one one. Who shot who? <laughs> What's your emergency? You know, uh, we've we've got our uh, our uh, 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 our other thing we do. You can't make this shit up. I mean, just uh -huh. all sorts of fun. So lots of good stuff. So head on over there, patreon.com/slash/game of crimes. 
And if you just feel like hitting us up, a pause for the cause, just go over to paypal.com. If you just want to throw a couple of the, you know, the dollars, the dineros, the uh, dinars, the liras, whatever it is, you, your, your kroners, you know, your currency of choice, just throw it over the wall. Hey, if you want to throw a million dollars at us, throw it. Yeah, because we answered that question in our Q&A, which we'll only find out if you join patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. You'll find out how we would spend that million dollars. And hit us up, Game of Crimes podcast at gmail.com or paypal.me slash Game of Crimes. Whatever, it makes it easier for you to support the show and help us bring you even better content. But this is a quick disclaimer. This is a show about crime. We talk about bad people doing bad things and bad people doing bad things to good people. We take the story seriously, but... We aren't ever going to take ourselves serious. If you haven't figured that out, just hang on. You will. And one of the ways we don't take ourselves serious, guess what time it is, Steve? Guess what? Uh, it's time for some more coffee. Uh, no, it's time for... Small... No, 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 not yet. Oh, um, sorry. Got a quick announcement to make. Sorry. I'm excited there. <laughs> hey, by the way, Sandy Salvato, our famous uh, and uh, a mafia queen in residence, mm -hmm. wanted to mention just quick, we have a fan page. We have our big page, which you can find out, as we said, at Game of Crimes podcast on Facebook. But we have, if you go to Facebook and you search for Game of Crimes fans... It's run uh, by our Sandy Salvato, our mafia queen in residence. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just wanted to mention, she wanted to mention that. So now that we mentioned it, guess guess what time it is, Steve? It's, well, it's time. Whatever you do, don't piss off Sandy. Yeah, don't piss her off. Don't. <laughs> it's time for. No, hold on. One more quick now. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> just one more. <laughs> okay. And by the way, to get onto that fan page, you only have to answer a couple EC questions. So just to answer, come on, people. Just even take a half-hearted stab at it. Just to answer a couple easy questions to get onto the page. It's really fun. So and Game of so Crimes you know, fans. We had to answer the questions, too. She's a tough lady. Don't piss her off. Yes, we have to answer them. Nobody gets, nobody rides for free, man. You got to pay your freight. Okay, now, Steve, really, guess what time it is? It's time for. Small, Small town, town police blotter. I thought I was going to fake you out again, didn't you? I was waiting. Speaking of Sandy, now, Sandy, I will tell you, she sent us this next story. Now, I'm going to read this next story, but there is a caveat to this. So she goes, I dare you to do this story. God, dare accepted. Yeah. She said, if I have to read it, you guys are going to read it. So the headline is, and this comes from a real website. Roses are red, I'm scared of bugs. A burglar contracted syphilis and two types of herpes after snorting more than 50 grams of dried human semen and the mistaken belief that it was illegal drugs. Now, I say that to say this. Sandy, you have been taken in by a satire site. World Net Daily News. If you go down to the bottom and read what it says down at the bottom of World Net Daily News, it says... World Net Daily, I'm sorry, report assumes all responsibility for the satirical nature of its articles and for the fictional nature of their content. So, hey, Derek accepted. We read the story. Um, now, trust me, there's probably somebody out there that stupid, which leads me into our next story. Steve. <laughs> but now, but see, now these people done pissed off Sandy. So there will they be did. retribution. Who knows? There will be retribution. Be. Anytime your name ends on a vowel, this thing of ours is going to happen. So, uh, Steve, this next one comes to us from Hillsboro, North Carolina, population 9,660. Salute. Salute. And I've actually been Steve, there. You ever been in a high-speed chase in Hillsboro, North Carolina? Nope. Have you ever been in a high-speed chase? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Stupid things happen during chases, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Ever found a gun from a guy in a car? Uh -huh. Found a whole bunch. Yeah. Well, this guy here gets the award. Um they attempted to pull over uh, Kyrie Jason Lloyd, 28, of Mebane for reckless driving. Um, they got into a chase with him, finally got him stopped, and as they approached the vehicle, they discovered that uh, he had a gunshot wound inflicted accidentally. You know why he inflicted it accidentally? He was trying to hide the gun. No. They shot him. A passenger in the vehicle told deputies that Lloyd accidentally shot himself while trying to disassemble a Glock handgun before pulling over, falsely believing that it would not be a crime to possess a disabled firearm. Well, and the only thing disabled is you, pal. Yeah, you're not. And mentally as well as physically. But And that's one of the cool things about the Glock. To clean the Glock, to break it down, you have to pull the trigger, which means you have to check the chamber before you pull that trigger to make sure there's not a round in there. And owning a Glock 23, I can tell you that now. When I said uh, he's disabled, I meant he shot himself. 
Uh, Lloyd is being currently charged with the following. Felony stupidity, felony stupidity, felony stupidity, in addition to operating a motor vehicle while attempting to flee or elude, carrying a concealed weapon. Now, here's the thing that makes this a really stupid small-town police spotter. He had a kid in the car when he did this, so he was also charged with child abuse by creating a risk of physical injury by discharging a firearm inside a vehicle while the child was present. Uh, speeding 70 into 45, driving while license revoked, and failure to properly secure a child in an appropriate safety belt. So uh, he's got a few charges pending against him, and it's easy to spot him. He's got the hole in his hand. Idiot. Yeah, and you'll probably recognize him, too, because he's got a big L on his forehead for loser. Loser. All right. Speaking of losers, which leads us into Louisa, Kentucky, population 2,679. Salute. Salute. By the way, we are really saluting, in case you guys are wondering. Yeah. Um, Steve, are you a country music fan? Yeah. Joe Diffie? Heard of. John Deere Green? Yeah. Yep. So there's a popular country song. And turned into criminal mischief, though, in Louisa, Kentucky. The Louisa Police Department is looking for the person or persons who took to the old Foodland building to write, Billy Bob loves Charlene, in letters approximately three feet high and painted in nothing other than John Deere Green. While it's unclear if the incident happened in the midnight hour, as in the late country star Joe Diffie's hit song, John Deere Green, it certainly happened on a hot summer night. Police, this is from the article, folks. Police posted a photo of the vandalized building to Facebook asking for the public's help. This occurred, Steve, June 16th, 2022. This is a current story we're talking about. Authorities have not determined if there is a paint that will cover it. There is no word from citizens in the area if they believe the culprit should have used red or if it looks good to Charlene. Anyone... With the information on this incident, is asked to contact the Louisa Police Department. There's not a lot that goes on in Louisa, I tell you. <laughs> well, apparently That's Billy Bob and Charlene are a hot thing down there. So <laughs> I love that song. Billy Bob loves Charlene. Oh, jeez. Ian John Deere Green. Anyway. <laughs> All right. Ah, <laughs> uh, I think that brings an end to the reading of today. Of, All right. Uh, and all of those things. <laughs> Hey, but which is actually a good setup, too, because the next guy we got is a, a kind of a hillbilly. But I'll tell you what, he's a hillbilly with a hell of a story. And by the way, Steve, I'm getting tired of the guests that you invite into our show that sandbag us. Jeff Sandy sandbagged us. Well, it's Tom because, Kirk. Yeah, these guys, they don't they don't toot their own horns. You know, there's an old saying, if you got to toot your own horn, it's not worth tooting. So they're not mm-hmm. they're not coming on the show bragging about the things that they've done. You know, it's it's uh, it's 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 kind of an endearing quality to have nowadays where hell if you show up for a ball game you get a trophy to take home with you and everybody takes a selfie of themselves and how many likes did i get and stuff these guys and let me tell you when you hear this episode and you hear what he did in the navy he tried to gloss over yeah then i did four years in the military and mm-hmm. then i'm you know, whoa 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 yeah. roll back a little bit <laughs> that one was um, a surprise <laughs> yeah by the way too the other surprise you're going to hear how seriously they take speeding in the state of west virginia um the finale, Steve, when they were going to, a, they, they make the arrest and it involves the helicopter. <laughs> Just, you got to listen for that. I'm telling you. You, you better gotta, obey the law in West Virginia. You, you better obey the law in West Virginia. But I'm telling you, what what a fun episode this was. Because like you said, Steve, humble guy. Yeah. But he rose up from the ranks. Uh, like you, uh, he had a very low GPA when he first started school the first time. Yeehaw. Point six. <laughs> Hey, I was a I was a Rhodes Scholar compared to that. <laughs> yes, you at one point nine. And Madison Sperry's uh, remember from her episode D is for diploma. Yep. Um, but but this is a guy who persisted, worked his way up. One of his first calls he got, you're going to hear about too, going to a triple homicide. Mm-hmm. Never had worked a homicide scene before. Never had seen dead bodies. Um, so right out of the academy, you know, right in, as he's working the road. Plus, then he works, uh, goes into undercover, does a lot of narcotics. But it's not the narcotics that really is the f- uh, frame for this story. It's his undercover work and working with Jeff Sandy, actually, from our previous episode on this case, too. So, Steve, I mean, I just I think you again, you you nailed these guys. You met them uh, and they agreed to be on. And we're very glad that they did, because let me tell you, hell of a story. I'm, that's all I got to tell you, folks. You got to listen to everything. Hell of a story. His accomplishments, Tom's accomplishments as a law enforcement officer, are, are just exceed anything that you could ever expect to hear. Uh, we don't want to spoil the story for you, but earns his law degree from West Virginia University while he's Steve, working. Steve, you said you don't want to spoil the you don't that's, want to spoil the just, story, and then you give it away. But that's just one of many things, and that's what a lot of cops do. They earn most cops earn their bachelor's degree while they're working full time as a police officer. Job. Here's a guy that got his law degree. It's just so impressive. 
Sounds like Pam Barnum, episode three. So we'll have to yep. get into it. But before we can find out about it, Steve, and before we hear these stories, I have to ask you, are you ready to play the biggest, baddest, most dangerous and hillbilly friendly game of all, the game of crimes? <laughs> hey, and listen, everybody, this is one where you need to get in, sit down, shut up and hold on because <laughs> I can't wait for you to hear about the penalty for speeding in West Virginia. Bring on Tom Kirk. Oh, this is going to be good. Welcome back, amigos, amigas. We were just talking with our next guest coming up because his boss was on with us the week before. We don't know what order these episodes are going to come out. But let me tell you right now, there will be a reference at some point to Star Trek, and you're going to have to figure it out. So <laughs> welcome to the show, Tom Kirk. Thank you very much. Sir. Yes, sir. Hey, Tom, glad to have you on the show, brother. Thank you. Same thing here. Yeah. Well, this is this is going to be fun, I think, because um, obviously Murph is pandering. He's wearing his West Virginia shirt for you, absolutely, so that you can uh, you know see that he's he's from By God, West Virginia. There and uh, but with you though, I mean, this is fun because, like I said, we had your boss on last week, and you both have kind of inter interconnected histories. But as with everyone, we always want to start off with you know by Tom. How did you get started in this thing of ours? You know, how did you? What made you, what possessed you to even think about going into law enforcement? Sure. Uh, my my dad, yeah, I'm second generation cop. Actually, my son is a uh, Kentucky State Trooper, so he's third generation. We're kind of hoping it's going to stop there. But uh, but he, uh, my dad. <laughs> you my mean dad, because he's in Kentucky? No, because, uh, you know, I, we've got, I've got two grandsons that I, I dearly love. They're now uh 16 and 15 and i tell my son every night right before they go to sleep bend down kiss them and whisper in their ear firefighter firefighter because because you know every <laughs> everybody loves firefighters yeah, yeah they do they do so but my dad was uh he actually died in the line of duty when i was seven and uh and his his name's on the wall there in in dc that's kind of an interesting story too but uh you know he was my what hero. was your dad's name uh, Robert Lee Kirk, and uh, uh, he was a what Fairmont City. What agency was police. he with at the time? He was with the uh, Fairmont City Police, and uh, and loved his job. Wow! But, uh, what, but can it, you tell us what happened? Well, yeah, uh, he uh, was just getting off duty and got a call that uh, a car had wrecked there in Fairmont, down over a hill. So he and his partner. Uh, went to the scene in the car. Actually, it went down over a hill and into uh, one of these gas, natural gas substations. So there was like natural gas, you know, spewing out at a real high rate. And so uh, his partner was radioing in the, the fire department, ambulance, things like that. And my dad went down and both there were two people trapped inside the car. Uh, they were out. Uh, because of the wreck and because of the gas fumes and he was afraid the car was going to blow up so uh he did like a fireman's carry and carry and both of them were very large people carried one up over the hill uh out of danger went down uh grabbed the other one carried them up over the hill and sat down and had a heart attack so oh. yeah so uh, a hero saving other people man that's yeah that's, uh, it doesn't but, get any but, higher than that yeah, you know that was that was him though. I mean, he I I personally witnessed him save two people's lives while I was growing up. Like I said, I I was seven when he passed on. So, so you know, like I said, it, you know, he was my hero. So you know, how do you not want to be like your yeah. hero? So, so that's that's True. you know that's where my interest always lied. Plus, you know, especially back in those days, being a police officer was a very tight tight community. And so even after uh, he died, you know, we had people from uh, police officers drive by the house, checking out on us all the time, seeing if mom needed anything. You know, she had three kids she was trying to raise by herself. And, mm -hmm. and, and it, it was pretty tough back in those days. So, you know, see that camaraderie that he had with all those people, and especially after he died, uh, that camaraderie continued. Uh, it just, you know, it just got in, ingrained in you. I actually, when I was a freshman in high school, 
Mrs. Smith was my civics teacher. And on career day, I did my paper, and I'm sure it was probably a page, page and a half, but I did my paper on career day, what I wanted to be, and I wanted to be a West Virginia State Police undercover agent. Uh, now, that was a freshman in high school, yeah. it, which was interesting because back in those days, uh, the state police didn't even have undercover units at that point. But, but uh, so you know, what that, made you what made you decide? I mean, how did you I'm sorry about that, because that's in for let's not gloss over that. Did you, how much contact would you have with the state police before you were a freshman in high school? I mean, and what made you think undercover? What was it? Because your dad was obviously in uniform, a lot of people in uniform. What made you decide undercover is the life for me? Well, uh, I think some of the movies that I'd seen, some of the things that I'd watched on TV, plus drugs were just getting into the to the system at that point. I mean, you know, marijuana was uh, – we had a couple kids in our high school that used marijuana, and everybody shunned them. I mean, they, they, they – everyone stayed away from them. But I could see that developing, mm -hmm. uh, and so – uh, I had seen, uh, my dad had left a lot of books, uh, that he had read, uh, about police work. And, and I found an old application that he'd had where he had applied for the state police. Uh, and he'd never sent the application in. Uh, but, uh, I remember looking through mm -hmm. his books and, and those things like that. And, it, and that kind of got my interest. And then, you know, as I was going through high school, I, I just, I read books on, on undercover operations and uh you know it just really really fascinated me so so that's kind of what i stuck with and uh that i went to wvu after a semester and a gpa of 0. 0.6 i i thought you know maybe <laughs> academic well you and Murph were close then yeah. <laughs> no, i was well, a lot higher than i had a 1.9 <laughs> Well, wow. Yeah, see, you would have been you one of the How do you get a 0.6 GPA? <laughs> well, you, uh, you, you didn't have <laughs> to right. try very hard to do that. Uh, I, think, I think I had an A. <laughs> I had an A in gymnastics uh, or swimming. I forget what it was I had. And it, it, the rest of them I just didn't go to. So, so you know, that, that was, that was uh, right at the height of the Vietnam War. And uh, I thought, you know, maybe I should do something else other than try to go to college. So, you know, I went into the military and, uh, and like my dad, my dad had been in the Navy. I went into the Navy and uh, got involved with uh, special projects within the Navy and uh, did that for four years. And I got out and drove a concrete truck until my application got accepted by the state police and went into state police. Well, when you said you joined the Navy, I thought you said you joined the military. I'm sorry. I'm confused. Oh, oh. <laughs> and I, I sorry, I'm Army Joe. Crap. Army Joe. That from him, Tom. I'll take those for a little while, you know, because I, I just need to. But <laughs> <laughs> hey, by by the way, I'm making a command decision. Steve, you started doing this, and I think we're going to do this here. Um, I had no idea when we started this about your backstory. So yeah. we're going to dedicate this episode to Patrolman Robert Lee Kirk, Fairmont Police Department, wow. West Virginia, into watch Friday, August 8th, 1958. So Absolutely. Um, there's no higher honor than to be on with somebody who's the child or spouse of a surviving, uh, you know, fallen officer. So uh, seriously, I've got friends on the wall. I know Murph does. I know you do. Uh, it's a it's a place of honor. So we just wanted to, before we get too far and too funny into this, I just wanted to kind right. of bring us back and say, Hey, let's not forget, never forget, never forget the fallen. Very good thanks. point. And, and yeah. uh, God bless him. God bless your family, Tom. Well, thanks. I appreciate that. Okay. Now back to dogging on you in the Navy. So, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> serious stuff over No, but, but uh, where did, but seriously, before you gloss over too much of the Navy stuff, uh, where, did you go anywhere uh, international? Were you O'Conus, as they say, or were you just Conus during that time? No, I, I actually, uh, when I got involved with this uh, special projects, uh, I flew on board a, an aircraft called a P-3 Orion, which was a... The uh, Orion, mm -hmm. you were sub-hunter. Uh, yeah, actually, that's, uh, that's what we did. And, and the one I was on was a prototype, so... They were using the equipment that we had to, to figure out everything else that that aircraft could do. And, uh, and they figured out that, that not only could we find subs, but we could find any large piece of metal that you couldn't see from the air, like oh, a down plane somewhere in 
Cambodia that uh, went into the canopy. You know, over there, the canopy, the trees are so dense that if a plane flies into them, unless it burns and leaves a big burn spot, the canopy opens up, swallows them, and goes right back. So, uh, so they used us to uh, go over and, and find some down aircraft that maybe had uh, wandered off of uh, of course and ended up in places that they shouldn't have been. So it, it was, you know, for a uh, 18, 19 year old kid, it was pretty interesting. Did they send you guys down in the Bermuda Triangle? Uh, actually, that's where we trained at most of the time. Uh, Ooh. so, Ooh. but yeah. So how long were, uh, were you flying off of a, a ship then or were you land-based? No, we were, ban- we were land-based. My, actually my unit was based out of, uh, Southern Florida, or Southern Florida, Southern Maryland, uh, a place called Patuxent River Naval Air Station. Yeah. But, uh, but we flew. I mean, constantly. We flew all over. Uh, whenever we would try something new on the aircraft, we'd have to fly out to Burbank, California for them to install it. And then, then we would take it, you know, overseas and over to, uh, you know, into China, uh, just everywhere, testing it, uh, you know, actual operations, things like that. So, yeah, it was pretty Very good cool. for a young kid. Where are some of the places you flew to that you are authorized to disclose, as they say? Uh, well, my wife keeps bugging me about uh, being in Hawaii twice, uh, but both times, as most places, we'd fly in right at dark and fly out before daylight came. So that's how much of Hawaii I've seen. <laughs> uh, but uh, probably uh, we we flew in and out of, um, and I am trying to think of some of the places that I that you know I wouldn't be violating anything to to talk about, but. Uh, we did fly into Cambodia, uh, from time to time. Uh, we flew, um, we had other flights, you know, a lot of people don't realize, but back in those days, there were other fronts that we had in, uh, in South Africa, in, uh, Australia, even that, uh, we would have to fly in and out of that. Uh, and you have to realize I was like at the bottom of the totem pole. Uh, on this flight crew. So there's a lot of times we flew places that I had no idea where we were flying. And once we landed, I had no idea why we were there. We actually flew into Tainan, Tainan, Taiwan. And when we flew in there, while we we flew out of Iwakuni, Japan, and while we were in the air, the government changed hands uh, in Taiwan. And we didn't know that. They had been taken over by uh, the Chinese. And we didn't know that in, until we tried to land and uh, and we couldn't get anyone to speak English uh, over the radio, which is, you know, every airport in the world has to have an English speaking person there. And and so when we finally got someone there, they uh, they announced that uh, that they had changed hands and that we were not allowed to land. Well, you know, we had already flown past what's called bingo fuel, meaning uh, if you don't turn around, around at bingo. Yeah. Yeah, you don't make it back. So, so there wasn't any place for us to go but to land. So we landed in in uh, Tainan uh, and stayed there for three days before they allowed us to leave. And we wouldn't allow them on board our aircraft. I mean, we have we have Chinese nationals there that in you know our aircraft had crypto, uh, you know, as high as security devices on it as you could get. So, yeah, again, you know, for an 18, 19 year old, it thought, you know, my butt's going to be buried right here at the end of the runway. No one from West Virginia is going to come over here to save me. So that's probably where I'm going to. Yeah, that was interesting. That was a little pucker factor there, wasn't it? Especially for a young man. (laughs) Absolutely, it was. Hey, do you remember that incident with the Chinese where I'm not sure it was the P3. I think it was something similar, but I think it was a pilot's name was Shane Osborne. But remember when that Chinese aircraft got so close, they clipped the nose cone and they had the land actually in China. And one of the things they were doing before the Chinese boarded is they were taking hatchets and everything because you guys obviously had to have procedures to bust up your crypto, you know, and your cards and your hardware and stuff. They were just... They, they refused to open the door for like 30 minutes or 40 minutes, but eventually they had to. And I think they were held captive for 10, 12 days until they were released. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. In fact, that was a, that was a P3. That's what I thought. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Man. Yeah. In Glad fact, you we had, on that one, huh? uh, yeah, you know, 
something real, kind of a side thing, real interesting on that was when we were setting up the intelligence center here in West Virginia, uh, we had a, a guy from D.C. Uh, that was coming in from uh, the DNI to help us set that up. Well, he also was a uh, commander in the Naval Reserves, and they kept calling him back. So when his incident happened, they actually called him back into service. And about two months later, uh, we were having a meeting in uh, actually down at the Greenbrier, and he came to, and we were sitting around talking, and something came up about about uh, Taiwan, and and I brought that story up, and he said, "Oh my God, that was you guys." And I said, "What?" And he said, "Well, being involved in intelligence, the very first thing we do is we look back." to see if this has happened before, how it was handled, good things that happened, bad things that happened. And he said the only other time that, and he was working on uh, exactly what Morgan was talking about. And he said the only other incident that we could find that was even close to this was uh, back in uh, 1972. And, uh, and I said, or December, 1971. And he's, and he said, that's the only incident that we could find that had ever happened before. And I said, yep, that was us. So, wow. yeah, that, that was interesting. So yeah. you're making history there before you got back to becoming a police officer. Look at you. Yeah, yeah I'm a footnote <laughs> somewhere, I'm sure. Yeah, but you were not, look, at, look at what you tried to gloss over, you sandbagger. We got to, we get, we're tired of getting sandbagged by our guests, so we're going to have a penalty. <laughs> um, yeah, look at all of this stuff you glossed over. But that has got to be way cool for a 19-year-old from uh, West Virginia. Where'd you go to high school at in West Virginia? I went to East Fairmont High School, and at that time, there was a really big difference between East Side and West Side. We considered everybody from the West Side of high school, or went to West Side, were were the upper, you know, the white collar people, and and the, the uh, East Side had all the blue collar, you know, they had the the Irish and the Italian workers, and and uh, so uh, so if you meet anybody that's fifty years old or older, and you ask them about which high school. They either tell you I went to East Fairmont or West Fairmont. If you just say, "Well, you went to Fairmont High School," that you know they're yeah, not that doesn't from float there. very well. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> that's, exactly. That's how they caught some escapees one time uh, up in uh, California. They escaped two guys out of state, I guess, committed some robberies, and they were sitting there and they go, "Oh, where are you from?" Uh, you know, and most people say, "You know, I'm from uh, San Francisco." They say, "Oh, we're from you know Frisco or something like that," and it's like. Uh, you felt the same from around here, and that's what that's what caught him. But back to our regularly <laughs> scheduled podcast. So, uh, you, Mister Sandbagger. So, you did your four years. Uh, any other interesting stuff you did during the Navy during that time? You wish to disclose to us? Uh, you know, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, any article? Uh, any yeah, article? You know, Fifteens had... or uh, non-judicial just, punishments? I was going to oh, say, no. did you go to jail? Or? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> you know, it was. We did have a flight since uh, we were flying on a P-3. The Russians had a similar aircraft, and they had some records that we were trying to break. So we we flew uh, from overseas nonstop back to Patuxent River, Maryland, to break the world record. Uh, and, uh, and it was really interesting. We waxed the wings down so we could get more uh, less drag. We put ice on them, dry ice to get more fuel in them. We did everything that we thought we could. And we had to, to fly back with, to, to make the trip long enough. We had to actually enter Canada and then fly back in to the U S uh, and then all the way to Patuxent river, Maryland. And, uh, uh, we didn't make it. Uh, we got to St. Louis and, uh, the, uh, pilot said, okay, look, uh, we've got some problems here. And about that time, and this is, uh, uh, Morgan, if you remember the sub hunter, the, the four engines, one of the engines burn out the, the, uh, the outboard engines, which is the way the fuel goes. It drains from the out to the end. So, so one of the, the starboard, uh, uh, engine burn out, meaning he ran out of fuel. So the pilot came back and he said, look, we need to make a decision. I don't think we're going to make it back to Maryland. So we either need to set it down or, to break the record, we might need to, to fly another couple hundred miles. But he said, I'm going to leave it up to the crew. Uh, I, I think at that time we had a 12-member crew. And he said, if we, I get one vote to set her down, I'm going to set it down. And he said, uh, "He said, Kirk, you're you're the lowest-ranked person here. He said, what's your vote? And I looked around and I said, set her down. <laughs> so, so I got a lot of bad looks from the rest of the crew. But as we're on final approach – 
uh, the second engine, the uh, port outboard engine, ran out of fuel. And as we were landing, uh, the third engine went out. Now, P3 oh. can fly on two oh. engines kind of rough, but uh, but they, they came on one engine. So just as we were landing, the third engine went out. They foamed the runway for us. We landed, uh, went all the way to the end of the runway, and uh, the tower told us which uh, which taxiway to get on. And we turned to get on taxiway, and the fourth engine went out. So they actually had to tow us from the taxiway <laughs> back to the fuel depot to get fuel. So even though I got a lot of hard looks a uh, half hour before that, uh, I couldn't have uh, bought a drink that night myself if I wanted to. I, I was pretty popular that evening for That's young kids. I was going to say, I so. bet you can pay for a drink for a while. You saved your whole crew. Yeah. And look at this. You were going to gloss yeah, over by saying, I did four years in the Navy, then I drove a concrete truck. Look <laughs> how much shit we passed over just because you wanted to talk about the exciting life of being a concrete truck driver. Holy cow. Hey, hey. And, you know, and I got to say right off the bat here, that's one of the reasons we invited Tom on here because, because ladies and gentlemen, you can see he's very humble to start with here. He don't want to tell you all the stuff that he's been involved with. But uh, you, you just wait till you find out what he's done in his career. Because you just heard he's a college dropout, but where he goes from here is phenomenal. So, uh, not to mention uh, he's a fellow hillbilly. So I met him and, and uh, met him with Jeff and Sandy up in Columbus, Ohio. College dropout with a point six GPA. I don't think it was even that bad on Animal House when I heard their GPA. <laughs> <laughs> I thought yeah, mine was one point nine. Were you on double secret probation there, Tom? Mm. Yeah, mine was triple secret probation, and, and to be honest, it wasn't that secret either. I think they let everybody know. Oh yeah, yeah. All right. Well, wow. yeah, I, I, can, I can remember telling my mom when uh, when she got my grades. She said, uh, "You know, look, I don't know what we're going to do. We don't really have the money to keep sending you to school if uh, if you have these kind of grades." And I said, "Well, you know, it's funny you bring that up because I went over yesterday and signed up for the Navy." So. <laughs> So that was kind of a bitter sweet, sweet time at that point. Now, did you get any uh, benefits out of the GI Bill to go to college later? Yeah, actually, that's the reason why I went back to school is because uh, when I went into the state police, uh, my, my, I did two years uh, in uniform uh, as a trooper and then went to uh, uh, undercover for 17 years after that. But but while I was going uh as soon as I got to Beckley, uh, the guys there telling me, because we had a number of veterans there, said, you know, uh, you can get more money. You can almost get the same thing the state's paying you uh, tax-free from the government if you go back to school. So I went back to, uh, I went to, at that time it was called Beckley College, went to Beckley College uh, and continued on there. Uh, just to get the money, because uh, I think uh, the trooper salary at that time was like eight hundred a month, and, uh, and so just to get the yeah, just to get the additional money, uh, I went back to college, and uh, you know, I, obviously more matured at that point, and uh, you know, I started making good grades and and uh, define good this I, time I though, because point anything above <laughs> point six is good. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, when I graduated, including that point six that they add into that, I graduated magna magna cum laude. So, wow. so I did pretty good, uh, and in fact, good enough to where when I applied for law school, I got into law school. So, okay, you surprised now, your mom. I bet she was happy. Yeah, yeah, happier than well, she was the day I joined the military. Yeah, <laughs> happier than point six in the military. Yeah, before we go. <laughs> Before we go too far ahead, though, let's let's back up a little bit because uh, I want to talk about your exciting life as a concrete driver. Now, did you do any clandestine operations as a concrete driver? No, no. It, I did have some exciting times, but nothing worthy of, of this radio show. And let me tell you <laughs> something. When Steve asked me to come on this, you know, uh, I – you know, I looked at the website. I, I listened to a lot of the podcasts. And I thought, what in the world are they bringing me on here for? I mean, there there are some really important people that have done a lot for the country and, and for for you know the entire nation. Uh, and uh, so, I, you know, I am very humbled and and, uh, and really appreciate being on this. I still don't know why I'm on it. But the reason uh, you're on here, Tom, is because you're one of those people. And our listeners are going to agree 100 percent once they hear your whole story. This guy's he's full of surprises, ladies and gentlemen. So we're going to we'll see if we can pry him out of him today. 
<laughs> yeah. Just remember, we're both trained interviewers and interrogators, so you might be too, but we got a few tricks up our sleeve. We're going to pull some uh, good stuff out of you. That being said, you, how long were you did you drive concrete before uh, your application for the state police was accepted? Uh, probably about a year and a half. Uh, I, I worked on the block yard and, and drove a block truck and then eventually ended up driving concrete truck. And, and, uh, uh, that, you know, you worked in the summertime and they laid you off in the wintertime, which was kind of tough. I was married, didn't have any kids at that time, but I was married. And, and so that, you know, that was a little tough. So, uh, uh, it, it, and then I ended up, uh, I left there actually right before I went to state police, I left there, there's a company called Slumber J. Slumber J, yeah. uh, yeah, that, you know, big French company that, that surveys gas and oil wells, you know, they drop these these uh instruments down well uh i had a woman call me one day and she said uh look you're not gonna believe this but i looked at your profile you have experience in electronics from the navy and you're driving a concrete truck i've got a call here for a company that needs someone that can drive a truck that has electronics background and she said you're the only one in the world i think that i've ever heard that that can do that so so i worked for them for about six months before i got accepted into the state police academy Wow. Was that in the Charleston or the Fairmont area? Where was, would you have to go for that? Yeah, actually it was. Went down to places like Buck Cannon, which is very heavily, uh, a lot of gas fields down there. So yeah, we worked in Weston, Buck Cannon, places like that, the northern part of the state. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Slumberjay, I've got a friend of mine who's done some work with those guys. I mean, huge. I mean, some of these huge companies, oil and gas though, is just huge. A, a friend of mine, um, a former FBI agent, one of the big fraud cases he did was when they were building out the Hugoton gas fields and they had all this construction equipment in. The budgets on those things were so big, it was easy to steal pickup trucks, you know, just get them from fraud through fraud and hide them. They had like 15 uh, pickup trucks, you know, big diesel trucks and stuff missing that nobody could account for, but it took so long to find them because these things, like you say, are big dollar. But hey, Back to right. uh, back to regularly scheduled podcast. Okay, <laughs> let's talk about West Virginia State Police. What was your application process like for that? Um, what did you do? How long did it take? How long was your academy? Give us a few of the details there. Yeah, this, the uh, West Virginia State Police Academy is, and it, it goes up and down a week at a time. You know, depending on what the, the flavor of the training is, but uh, it's uh, six months long. And uh, and I applied, and and it's so different today than what it was back then. Back then, uh, I think there were thirty, I think thirty six hundred applicants for the state police at that time, uh, and wow. uh, they only chose thirty five to actually go through the academy. So so I, yeah, I, I thought you know there's absolutely no way I'll I'll go. You know at that time I still had my point six grade average from college. Uh, I had, you know, I, you know, I didn't have any support as far, I didn't know any politicians. I didn't know, uh, you know, other than my dad was the only police officer that, that could have really vouched for me. So I, you know, and, and I was sitting, taking tests with, with people that were sheriffs, deputy sheriffs, uh, DNR officers, things like that. So I never really thought that I'd get in, but someone messed up and, and uh, I got in and, uh, and went through their six months of training. And when I left that, like I said, my duty station was in the southern part of the state, down in the coal camps of West Virginia. Uh, and uh, and the reason why I went there was I was told, look, if you really want to learn how to be a trooper, if you really want to learn police work, go to the southern part of the state. Number one, they really like the state police. And a lot of times you'll be the only law enforcement for the entire county. And you will investigate everything. And it was true. In my first three months there, uh, at the end of my first three months, I investigated a triple murder. And I, and I remember pulling up to the scene and everybody just kind of got out of your way to let you go do it. And I'm three months out of the academy. And, you know, I'm trying to remember if I, you know, zip my fly up when I went to the bathroom and whether <laughs> I had my shoes shot or not. But uh, Hey, Tom, what, what year did you join the state police? Uh I got out of the military in 73, so I joined in, in 1974, the end of 1974. And where, uh, where, which, which detachment were you assigned to that in southern West Virginia? Yeah, at that time I was assigned the, the uh, 
the uh, Beckley Detachment, which is in Raleigh County, West Virginia. And at, at that point, we had the state divided into four different areas, and that was called Company D. So, so you know, like like uh, Morgan tell you, when you're with the state, you could be, you know, one day I could be working down there, and the next day they'd have a prison ride up in, uh, up in Moundsville, uh, and, you know, you're stationed in Moundsville for the next three months until things get, you know, calmed down and stuff. So, and that's well, one of the things I really like about strike. the state police. Yeah, well, the yeah, coal that was going to strike over Williamson and Logan. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've got I, a good you know, story. I've got a three minute story about that at some point. If you want to talk about that, we can talk about it. Now's the perfect time to do that. This is why we're here. So let's hear it. Well, okay. I, uh, jumping ahead of time here a little bit, I eventually became superintendent of the state police. And, and one of the things I vowed was, you know, we had a terrible relationship between the state police and the coal miners. You know, there was always, it was always a lot of problems. The, the coal miners hated the state police. State police didn't really like the coal miners. And so, so right after I became the colonel, uh, we had a national coal strike that started here in West Virginia. And so I brought my crew in. I said, look, we're, we're not going to take sides. Uh, we arrest people for violating the law and, and I don't care if they're a coal owner and I don't care if they're a minor. Uh, I don't care. We, we stay out of it until the law is broken and then we go do that. Well, uh, things began to heat up after a couple months and I got information that there was going to be a big march and, on the state police barracks and, and, uh, that, you know, there's probably going to be bloodshed. Well, I called Rich Trumpka who was head of the United Mine Workers at that time, and, and to see if I could come up and talk to him. And his secretary called me back and said, can you be here tomorrow? And I said, yes, I can. So I got our, our air crew guys, and I said, fly me to D.C. So they flew me. I go into Rich Trumpka's office, and I'm sitting outside in the waiting room. And the, his office was in this very old building with these, these high 15, 18-foot ceilings. And all around me were pictures that were like 10 feet high of miners being hit in the head by state troopers with their nightsticks and, you know, wrestling them to the ground. I thought that I'm not sure how well this is going to go because that <laughs> just just didn't look well. But, you know, I went especially in, making sure you weren't in one of those pictures, right? So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Most of them were Virginia State Police for some reason. But uh, I kept looking for West Virginia. We were in a couple of them, but we weren't highlighted. And it went in, met the guy, and, you know, we talked about things real briefly. Uh, and then we began to talk about our families. At that point, my son had been born, so we talked about kids. And it was a great meeting. And he ended up by saying, here's my personal number. If you hear things are getting out of hand, call me. And he said, if I hear things are getting out of hand, I'll call you. And I said, that's exactly where I need to be. So I thought, I thought that was pretty good. I thought that was pretty cool until the next day. And I got a call from uh, our governor and our senator at that time and asked me to come over and talk to them, and which I obviously did immediately. And I was asked, did you go to D.C. yesterday and talk to the president of the United Mine Workers? I said, yes, I did. And they said, yeah, don't do that again unless you let us know about that. So there's a lot of things going on in the background that you don't know about that uh, this could have messed up. So please don't do that again. And I said, I will not do that unless I get permission from you to do that first. So, so yeah, it, it <laughs> did turn out. Shaking the bush, as, ball, shaking the bush. <laughs> I know, exactly. So, uh, so it did turn out as, as well as I thought it was going to, but the results, you know, they were perfect. We ended up at the end of that cold strike that lasted 16 months. We didn't have one incident between the state police and the miners. And, and so it worked out really, we, we, burnt, we uh, really built a lot of relationships at that point. Uh, that was pretty cool. I got, well, I got to tell you a quick, quick coal miner story here, uh, Tom, that you'll appreciate. So I was a, a cop in Bluefield for six years, and then I went to the railroad police, Norfolk and Western, which became Norfolk Southern. So worked down in uh, Virginia, or Norfolk, Virginia for a couple of years, came back to Bluefield. And so the miners going to strike and they send us all down to Williamson. And uh, so we're walking the tracks one day. And uh, it was me and my lieutenant sergeant and the chief. And so this this miner comes just kind of jogging down the tracks. And so I went over and tried to be nice to him. I say, hey, sir, you can't you can't be on the tracks. And well, he lowers that shoulder and just plows me over and just keeps on running. 
And I got up to go after him, and I could hear my my chief, who'd never been a real cop, Mr. Murphy, Mr. Murphy, get your ass back here. You know, and so we came back, and I'm like, chief? <laughs> He's like, you know, you follow order, you follow order. So the, a couple of days later, we comes back. And the chief's not with us this time. And here comes another guy running down the tracks. I plowed his ass over. You'd have been proud of me. You'd have thought I was a defensive <laughs> linebacker. Cuffed him up, drug him up the hill. Now, as I'm dragging him up the hill, I look on the road, you know, and the, and the track sat lower than the, the roadway. And up on the hills, about seven or eight troopers, Western troopers, got their hats on looking good. And they look at me, and they're just going, yeah, that's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> course being a trooper you you get this tom we're not going to get our uniform dirty unless we absolutely have to so <laughs> no, no no they, they can be that and your cruiser missing with your cruiser are the uh, oh. two things you don't want to do yeah felony oh, offenses man. yeah that's right <laughs> <laughs> hey well uh, let's stuff. let's go let's go back in time when we kind of gave away some of the ending uh, which was a tactical error on my part this, we shall not make that no, mistake no. again so you will not sandbag us again like that so um uh <laughs> no. but kind of going back uh I want to go back to this triple homicide. I mean, in the Navy, I know you were doing a lot of work in the air, but uh, had you ever seen, um, uh, you know, the, I mean, look, dead bodies. I mean, a lot of times people get in law enforcement, the first time they see a dead body is like an accident, but showing up on a homicide, triple homicide, was that the first time you had seen something like that? Actually, it was. Uh, most of what I did in the Navy, you know, was under the cover of darkness and we'd fly in and out. And, and uh, you know, if anything, we flew in. Uh, what at that time was called underwater demolition team, which now is called Navy SEALs. Navy SEALs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'd fly them in and out. And, you know, they, uh, you know, if we flew in and an aircraft was down, their job was to go out and destroy the aircraft, destroy any equipment that was there and bring back any survivors, which there never were any survivors. But, yeah, you're right. That is the first time that uh, that I was actually faced with anything like that. And and you always wonder how you react. But I tell you, especially because I was so new, uh, you, you're scared to death you're going to forget something. You know, obviously with three people being dead and uh, and the, uh, the suspect standing there holding a gun when you show up, uh, you want to do everything right. Because you know people's families are involved, you you don't want to miss something up. So so you're so concentrating on, you know, making sure you take photographs of everything, making sure people stand back out of the crime area, uh, and and it had happened like maybe 20 minutes before I got there. So so there were probably close to 100 people standing around. So so there's just so much to think about that you don't really think about that till later on, you know, way after the case is over with and you start thinking about, you know, the impact that that has on on the individuals that were involved. When yeah. you when you I'm sorry Morgan, when you reported there, were you the only trooper or did they send some other uh, guys to yeah. help you? Or? No, I was the only trooper at that time. That was in the the very southern uh tip of our patrol area. And uh, uh, it was at a, a high school that uh, it was during the summer. The high school wasn't open, but it, there was a, a house actually sitting right next to the high school where it happened. And so there's a, a, this huge parking lot for the high school and it was filled with people when I got there. But no, I was it. I think there were a couple of deputies there that at during that time in history and especially in the southern part of the state, uh, state police basically handled about any felony. And so especially something that involved a, a triple murder, uh, then, uh, you know, they they said, tell us what you want us to do. And, you know, I had them taking photographs and watching the crowd and stuff. But, you know, again, you know, we, we were the person that orchestrated everything. And again, three months out of the academy, you know, it's just one of those things that, you know, you both were cops, you know, you know, you just you, to do your job, you just have to take control of the situation and do the do the best that you can. I'm sorry. I was, I was going to say back then, the West Virginia State Police, they probably had the ultimate respect in the state of West Virginia for a law enforcement agency. I mean, you guys, you look good in your, in your four screen uniforms, your cruisers look good. You know, back then, I think, wasn't there a height requirement of six foot or six one? There was. At that um, time, you had to be at least six foot yeah. tall. Yeah. And there was, I mean, there was some commanding looking people coming around and, and we can, <laughs> Morgan, we could tell you stories, but you could too, I'm sure with guys you knew all day long of, of, you know, the Ligurskis and Ralph Porterfield and some of the guys, uh, Randy Howe and Steve Lester. And, oh, yeah. I mean, a ton of guys down there that you just have immense respect for. Yeah. Yeah, we had 
for a long time, we had a height requirement for the state patrol. They started changing that, but the, the hats, the campaign hats always made you look bigger. But I want to oh, go yeah. back. You said something too, Tom, and I think it's, I think it's important people understand too. They go, how can you work a scene like that? It's good and it's bad. One of the things cops tend to do is compartmentalize stuff. It's like, I'll deal with the emotion and the trauma, whatever later. But right now it's like, here's my mission. I got to work the crime scene. I've got to interview people. You know that there are dead bodies there, but you don't think about it in that way. You don't think about stuff until later. And I mean, that had to be, I mean, look, it's, I'm sitting here thinking me three months out of the Academy, if I got sent to work a triple homicide by myself, uh, you know, what would I have done? Well, Obviously, you did what you had to do, but let's talk real quickly too about the outcome of the case. So, what ha I mean, it's nice to have the suspect hang around uh, and be there, but what was the outcome of the case? What what eventually uh, through your investigation uh, happened? Yeah, he pled uh, guilty. I mean, there were a couple witnesses. By the time he shot the third person, uh, had drawn some attention to some people that were around there. So, so you know, he, he just went ahead and pled, uh, and, and you know, it was one of those. Uh, you know, triangle type situations where the girlfriend and then the girlfriend's dad and and then the girlfriend's brother were all on scene when when he went to talk to the girl and it, that's just way it ended up and and you know there wasn't any any problem as far as the case goes but Morgan you're exactly right when you get there I and I sometimes I feel guilty about when I got there because you know there's there's three different crime scenes within one outside and two on the inside of the house. And of course the bodies are still there and you're taking photographs of the bodies and, and uh, you know, where one tried to get outside and knock stuff over and you're taking pictures of all that and the emotions of what happened at the time of the shootings doesn't even enter into it. You know, everything is post. Uh, so, so uh, I remember later and it, I mean, much later, it's probably a year or two down the road when uh, when I came across the name of the girl that got killed uh, and, and it was in a news article or something. It wasn't actually her, but it was another girl that had that same name and it hit me. And I sat there and I thought about that. And, you know, and I, I, I remember even when it went to court, uh, the mother was still alive and she wasn't there at the time or she'd probably been dead, too. But, you know, I just remember how the mother hung on everything it was that she did, because at that point, you know, that police officer is the entire world to a victim like that. And, and that's the way she was. And, and, you know, we stayed in contact for a long time after that, uh, because her, basically her entire family was wiped out at that point. The show said passion. You, yeah. You said you felt guilty. Why did you, what did you feel guilty mm -hmm. about? Well, you know, you, you would think that when you got there that, you know, here, here are three bodies that, an hour earlier were alive and that you would treat them, uh, I don't know, respect might not be the right word, but that you would treat them differently than just being a piece of evidence at that point. But you can't, as you guys know, you can't do that. You have to take all emotions right. out of it at that point, you know, and, and I'm sure both you guys will agree the worst crimes that I investigated were ones that involved kids. Yeah. And and those are the ones that really haunt you is, is you go back and you think about back when you were a kid or you had friends that that uh, had kids that were mistreated or, or you know, who's, who's lost a parent or both parents. And, and, you know, it's only it's only when you're not working and you're in that quiet time that you begin to think about things like that. But, yeah, I, I thought, you know, that, that was probably pretty disrespectful of me not to pay more attention to the fact that there were three lifeless bodies there. But again, you just, you can't do that. You, you wouldn't be able to do your job if you did that. That's well. exactly right. And, and your, your focus, what your mission is at that moment is to solve that crime because as our title says, we're law enforcement. And it's not that we don't have compassion and feelings for the, for the victims as well as the family members of the victims. And at times, even the suspect, which is very rare, but occasionally you do. Uh, but it's just you, that's something you have to be able to. It's, it's like pulling up to an, an accident scene where either, you know, people or there's, I mean, mutilated bodies, but maybe a survivor. And it's so easy to go up and just get sick from the carnage that you're seeing and maybe throw up. But I, it, Morgan hit it on the head a while ago when he said you're able to compartmentalize this information, what you're doing, and then you deal with your personal feelings later. And, exactly. and you know what? I mean. 
today they call that PTSD uh, for some folks. Back then, it was like, suck it up, cupcake. You got another call coming in. That's a fact. And I'm not saying that's right by any means. I know that probably didn't come out the best way, but I don't, no. I don't mean to uh, minimalize PTSD because we actually know that is a true event now. Well, and we didn't know enough about it back then. It was like the same thing with you after um, – I've told you guys. I've told the other guys the story before. The folks on the on our podcast have heard it. But one, you know, one of the calls you don't. There's t- two kind of calls you don't want to get to. One is an officer down, and the other one is baby not breathing. And I got the baby not breathing one, died in my arms basically. And it's like it just messes with your head because my mm-hmm. daughter was basically the same age at the same time. But going yeah. back to what you said though, I, I mean. We had a homicide one time. Um, I get called out like five o'clock in the morning. A patrol officer found a car, headlights on, windows busted out, blood spatter on it. Obviously, something bad. And I'm the you know I'm, I'm the detective on call, so I get out. And long story short, um, we end up through process of investigation stuff find this guy's body down by the river. We had the patrol aircraft up. You know, we went looking because we found debris in the front of the grill that said, "Hey, this has got to come from someplace where the sagebrush and stuff was." So we started flying, found the body. Um, but because it was getting so late in the day, this is during the winter, we had no choice. We had to leave the body out there all night, secure the crime scene because we could not process it at night, uh, without trampling over evidence and stuff. And so that's another thing that's tough too, is the family goes, why'd you leave the body out there all night? You hate to tell them because it's, that is our best piece of evidence right there. And he was run over eight times by his own vehicle left to die out there. And then these, the, the little gangbangers drove it back. But that goes back to what you said. It's a, the body you have to respect the body, but at the same time, when you when you divide your brain in half, one is the clinical side, you know, uh, I, I'm here to investigate. The other side is the empathetic side, hey, I feel for you. But the clinical side says it, it is a piece of evidence. The best evidence we have is going to come off this body. And if I screw the crime scene up, I actually do more of a disservice to the family because I've screwed the crime scene up and we will never get the person responsible for this. Exactly. Right. And you want to convict them. If, I mean, they, you know, if they broke the law, they need to, to pay the penalty that goes along with it. Okay, we went too dark. We got to get back to making fun of somebody. So, uh, that, like, me, me. It's, it's, let's make fun of a firefighter. Yeah, let's. Let, anyway, we got to. But anyway, but that's. But you know, you, but you're right. So, but uh, fortunately, like you said, that case went well, and you did two years. So, but you said something interesting earlier, and let's talk about it now. You said when when you wrote that paper, you said you wanted to be an undercover uh, investigator, undercover uh, UC for the state police, and they had none at those time. When did they finally start doing undercover investigations, and is that is that why you did your two years in uniform and then went right into that? Well, uh, I think they started their first unit like uh, in the early 1970s. Uh, I was like narcotics 2.0 uh, because I I came in just as some of the guys were leaving, uh, but they actually started an undercover uh, unit. Uh, in like 72 or 73, which is when I would have been getting ready to go to the academy. Uh, they, they, in fact, they, they weren't even sure how to do that. And they uh, tried something new. Instead of putting troopers through the academy and then becoming uh, regimented towards the way you know, police officers, troopers are, uh, they thought, we're just going to send these guys through a, a two-week training course for uh, uh, law and, and evidence, things like that. And then we're going to put them right out on the street. What a mistake that was. What a mistake that was. So then by the time I came in, uh, they said, no, you know, you have to go all the way through the Academy, uh, and you have to come off probation. And again, at that time in state police, you had six months Academy and you had a year and a half of probation. So basically you had two years, uh, before you actually, that you could be dismissed at any time for any reason whatsoever. And then is when you actually began your, your career in the state police after two years. So, uh, so I went ahead and applied for the undercover unit. Uh, actually when I was going through, uh, basic training, uh, through the Academy and, uh, and undercover officers weren't really highly thought of by a lot of troopers back in those days. Because, you know, you didn't. <laughs> you damn young whippersnappers. Because you weren't yeah. in uniform and you didn't look good and you didn't write tickets, right? That's right. You, you had haircut, long hair and a beard. Your car. And dr- you drove a sports car. You, you just, you know, you didn't live by rules and regulations. So, yeah, a lot of times, uh, a lot of times uh, you weren't too highly thought of. So, so I think that held me back a little bit. But, uh, but 
you know, after I, I got two years of uniform in, then it finally came through. A position came open in the undercover unit, and they called me up. And next week, I reported uh, to the undercover unit. Where was that at? Where'd you have to go? Yeah, Charleston. Uh, the undercover unit worked at that time, went throughout the entire state. So everyone was based out of Charleston. And so I would have to drive from, uh, from Beckley down to Charleston. Uh, for our meetings and things like that. And over the years, you know, like I said, I, I did that for 17 years and, and I saw it switch from, from a, a fairly large unit, probably uh, as many as 30 or 40 people, which is large by our standard, because at that point we only had 400 troopers. So that was like 10% of our, our uh, the people that we had. And I saw it go all the way down to me at one point, they took everybody uh, out from undercover, and because I was so deep in uh, working uh, some organized crime in the northern panhandle, uh, the U.S. attorney went down and asked the superintendent to leave me in at least till that investigation was over. Well, by the time that was over, we began to build back up a little bit, and uh, and then finally built back up to when I formed BCI, uh, the Bureau of Criminal Investigations, was the first full-time legislative uh, enacted undercover unit that we had in the state police. And that wasn't until uh, 1990. Well, you guys were just trying to copy the Texas Rangers. One riot, one Ranger. They only need one Tom Kirk out there working this shit, man. That's, well, that's all hey, we need. He has experience in technology and driving a truck. Yeah, that's right. And I writing mean, tickets. Guess, Don't forget. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's where, you know, I got more in more trouble over not writing tickets than I ever did working undercover, you know, for 17 years undercover, you know, right? riding with bikers, everything else. And I got in more trouble for not writing tickets in the two years I was in uniform. So, but that's okay. Were I'll you writing that. warnings or you just weren't writing? And most time I didn't write them. You know, if you got a warning, you had to do something really bad. If you got a ticket, it's because you, you ran me off the road and I had to turn around and go back <laughs> and got my shoes dirty when Waste I- Waste my time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was more for wasting my time than it was for anything else. I got to come stop you. And by the way, if it's raining and I got to get my shoes and my and my uh, uniform wet, somebody is getting a ticket. Yep, yep absolutely. That was yep. that was if I had to go to a car wreck and I had to get out in the rain, somebody was going to get a ticket. That's right. Yep. By gosh, hey, uh, what what? Let's so let's work through that a little bit too. So that's unusual too, because most places it's one year probation, but. That was a long academy. Is that is that because they were teaching you, you know, what you would go through in a traditional state patrol academy if you're a trooper, as well as criminal investigation? What made it six months? Well, uh, I, I think the way it was set up, uh, we basically did twice of what any other police officer in the state did as far as training went. Uh, because we have what's called a basic class, and, and it's where all the city police officers and county police officers uh, have to go. And they go to three months of training. But what we did was, uh, you know, they just expanded ours. They, about everything that, you know, the law, firearms training, self-defense, extraction techniques, things like that, we just did twice as much. Uh, our training was twice as long as what everybody else's was. And I think it was just designed that way. And then I think the other part was, you know, it's kind of, we were sworn in the day we reported to the Academy, we were sworn in. So we were actually on the books at that point. And, you know, for a, a, especially a small town, West Virginia, uh, uh, police department that only has two or three officers to send one to an Academy for six months usually just have them come back and then go with a larger agency somewhere because they're already certified was tough. So I, I think that's why they left that at three months versus the six months that we had for the state police. You bring up a very good point. I know from Kansas, this happened there and they started trying to figure out that's what happened. People would come in, get their training and then, you know, go somewhere else. And now they've got restrictions that says, look, we put you through an academy and you don't give us, it's like the military, you know, you don't uh, give us your time and do your stuff. You owe us money. And so that was designed to stop the people who couldn't get on a large agency because they didn't have experience. So to go to a small one who needed people um, would hire them, go through the Academy. And then as soon as they could, they would move somewhere else. And that, you know, by the way, just so folks know for our players out there, when you look at the national statistics, there are 18,000 law enforcement agencies in the United States. Only 6% of them have 100 or more officers. 75% of all law enforcement agencies in the United States have 25 or fewer people. 
So one, two, or three at an academy is a big dent in your patrol investigations, whatever you have. So, you know, small this, you know, we're still driven by the small town. Yeah, I agree. Of, of course you do, because it's factually correct. Why would you disagree with that, Tom? No, I wouldn't. Hey, Tom, so <laughs> when you were in the academy, did you have to live there? Did you get to go home on weekends? How'd that work for you guys? Yeah, you went home on weekends unless you had weekend duty to where, you know, where you guard all the empty buildings while everybody is gone. Uh, but, yeah, for the entire six months. At, at that time, you know, things – I think things have changed to some extent. I, I'm not really – sure how much since I've been out of it, but, uh, yeah, back in those days now, and that was just for the, uh, well, actually that was for the basic class and for the cadet class is that you stayed down there from Sunday night till Friday evening. And for the state police, if you didn't do what it was you were supposed to, if you didn't make the right scores, if you, if your barracks was dirty and they're always dirty, doesn't matter how, how well you clean them up, they're always dirty. Uh, <laughs> then they'd keep you there till late Friday night, early Saturday morning, Saturday evening, just whatever they wanted to do. Yeah, if they had to be there, they wanted somebody to be there with them. True. Yep. <laughs> hey, now let's kind of uh, start on your undercover career because we want to lead into one of these cases here in a second, but you mentioned training. Um, did you get any, when you, you said you were like narcotics, UC 2.0, did they give you any undercover training or basically it was grow your hair out and go buy some dope? Oh, uh, again, at, in my day, uh, that's almost exactly what it was. I reported to Charleston on Monday morning and uh, didn't shave over the weekend, which is the first time in a long time that that had happened. And they, uh, they were actually moving the undercover headquarters uh, from the state police headquarters to uh, a site outside of town. Well, and there's a novel idea, oh, having all your yeah. UCs re- walk into this state police building. Oh, they oh. pick them off real easy. Okay, I just bought dope from him and him. I better leave the state. Uh, and, and back in those days, that's when the state police gave all of the driver's test. If you had a West Virginia driver's license, you took the test from a West Virginia state trooper. So, I mean, I can't tell you how many times that I was working undercover and I'd have somebody looking at me and, and a couple of times I had someone say, I think you gave me my driver's test. And so, <laughs> so, you know, that, that always, uh, that's always a strange feeling, but yeah. So, so the day that they're moving to their offsite location, I had to pick up uh, the displays that they took to high school. Remember the old displays where they'd have, this is what a marijuana cigarette looks like. And th- this is what a marijuana pipe looks like. And this is an amphetamine and, you know, just all kinds of crazy things that they had. Uh, I had to carry those out to the truck and then in, into the new building. That was my indoctrination on how to do undercover work. Two days <laughs> after that, I was working in one of the towns in West Virginia and, and it was so, it was so bad. I, I mean, my, my backup was a, uh, a, a miniature tape recorder, which again, you got to remember, this is early seventies was about, oh, I don't know, four times the size of a cell phone. And I had it taped my ankle with West Virginia evidence tape. That was my backup. <laughs> so that in, 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 in case if I got killed, when they dug they my body me. up. Yeah, hopefully the tape would still be in good enough condition where they could go back and see what happened. And, and every Monday I had to call the office to tell them I was still alive and what I'd worked on. So for an entire week, I'd be by myself, you know, with a pocket full of federal uh, dope money out trying to buy drugs. And and it, like I said, it was so bad. I remember one of the first uh, dope deals I went on. I'm actually driving the car. And there's two guys sitting in the back seat and one in the front seat. And the guys on the back seat, I hear one of them tell the other one, hey, give me a shotgun. Now, you know, I had no idea what they, I didn't know what they meant. And by, <clears throat> for the, those listeners that don't know what a shotgun is, that's, that came about back in Nam where uh, uh, the troops were smoking dope. And you take the end of the shotgun, you break it open, and you blow the smoke from one end of the shotgun over to your buddy that's sitting in another foxhole, and you blow the smoke right into his mouth so that you wouldn't lose anything. So that's what a shotgun was. But in my eyes, the shotgun was these guys are getting ready to blow the back of my head off while I'm sitting here. So I'm trying to reach for my gun, which is down in my boot, 
my socks wrap around the boot and I'm trying to get that out while these guys are talking about shotgun. And I finally look in the rear view mirror and I see what they're doing. I think, Oh, that's what a shotgun is. So, so that's how I learned how to work narcotics. Now, <laughs> that's not a comfortable I'm surprised feeling. you didn't accidentally pull out your tape recorder because you had the, both of them on the ankle and had them a tape recorder with, oh. you know, <laughs> West Virginia State Police evidence tape around oh, it going, okay, man. freeze, nobody move. No. It's a tape there, recorder, you know, dude. Yeah. Very possibly could have happened at any time, at any time. Jeez. Oh, my God. So when did you start hitting your stride? When did you start finally figuring this out? And what did it take for you to figure out? Because, we, we, you know, we've talked to several uh, ATF folks, uh, DEA folks, people who worked undercover, and ATF used to have a fantastic UC course. And they would, I mean, you would really get trained in the techniques and the things you had to do. How long did it take before you really got comfortable working uh, UC? Well, uh, and again, back in those days, it, it was widely thought that you could only work undercover for two, maybe three years. And then they put you back in uniform because they said that, you know, they didn't want you to get corrupted. They they didn't want you to lose the the spread the core of, of the camaraderie between uniform people, uh, a lot of other things. But, you know, I, I started to get in. I, I remember I almost got fired because I, I came into the office one day and uh, and I'd, I'd trim my hair and I'd trim my beard. And I remember my sergeant saying, okay, what's going on? And I said, you know, I'm getting tired of buying the, this, the dope off the same people on the street corner every day. I said, you know, we need to go after the people that are uh, that are bringing this in. And I said, by what I've been able to tell, these are college kids. You know, these are professional people bringing this in and then they're giving it to all their dealers. And I said, they're not going to have anything to do with someone that looks like me with, a, with the type of hair I have and type of look I have right now. So, you know, so I cleaned up a bit and he said, well, he said, I don't know how long you're going to last at, at this job, but go ahead. Well, I started making some big cases. So, so after about three years, uh, they decided to leave me on for a while. And, and I think the first school they sent me to was a, a DEA basic narcotics school. And, and about half of it was kind of boring because I'd been doing it for three years. And the other half was, oh, my God, that's interesting. So that's why that happened. Or, yeah, I wish I would have had this three years ago. That probably could have caught me out of a, a couple of tight situations. So, so that, that was the first real training I had was about three years into working undercover. I went to that same two week, I assume it was like the two week yeah. uh, basic investigator school. I went through the same DEA course. In fact, the guy teaching it, trying to think of his name, Steve, I don't know if you might know him, but the guy, the dude was so old. I, I don't want to say so old, but he'd been around for a while. He was still, he was still wearing a jacket that said BNDD, Bureau of Narcotics uh, and Dangerous, dangerous Drugs. Dangerous Drugs, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. wow. Man, well, you know what? I, and talk about... It sounds funny. It probably sounds funny to our listeners. It sounds funny to me that the, the fact that they just wanted you buying dope from whoever was selling versus going after the organization because that's what, you know, I mean, and I know there's a different focus at, at the local level, the state level, level, and the federal level. But, I mean, that's very forward thinking on your part to say we're getting nowhere here. You know, you, you take one small dealer out and 18 step up and take his place. You know, talk about whack-a-mole. That's not even in the in – the, you're not even keeping up with what's going on. Well, uh, you know, what was interesting about that is I had my sergeant at that time, and I didn't find this out until I became colonel, and, and they brought me my jacket uh, that I that had all my stuff from the day one when you come in, and I read where he had recommended that I go back in uniform because he said, you know, he just he just doesn't fit the mold of the type of person we want for this. Well, I also had a lieutenant that kind of liked what – I was doing, and he was the guy. He said, look, uh, we're going to do something here. He said, we're, we've started a, a brand-new unit with DEA. It's a DEA task force. And he said, <clears throat> we've never done this before, but he said, there's a Charleston City police officer. His name's Richard McGinnis. And he said, you, and he said, we'd like for you guys to go down and work out of the, the uh, DEA office. And that's where I met a good friend of, of Steve's, a guy named Jerry Reinhardt. Uh, was oh, the yeah. uh, assistant agent in charge at that point. That's where I first met him. But if I had been for doing that, I don't think they would have ever put me on that DEA task force, which ended up being, I mean, we turned a lot of pretty big cases being on that task force only because no one had was doing it back in those days. Well, and, and now that opens up a whole additional set of resources, which state and local agencies don't typically want to commit 
that type of money or assets to just you know narcotics investigations. So by by coming on the uh, the task force and and eventually going to the organized crime drug enforcement task force under the Department of Justice, it just opens up a ton of money. So you can actually start not only making bigger cases, but uh, you get you get access to assets that you typically just wouldn't have access to. Hey, and Tom, let's let me ask you this too, because I know you said earlier it's before it's like you. There was marijuana, and I remember in high school, same thing. You get a couple, you found out, oh, they smoke weed, stay away from them. It was different then. When you started getting on this DEA task force, what were what were some of the big what were, what were what were the forms of dope that were causing the big problems? Because I'll tell you, one of the most impactful things I watched on, and, and if this was on the prescription side, but I watched that Hulu special called Dope Sick, you know, with Michael Keaton yeah. about the OxyContin. I mean, your heart just goes out when you see about how they manipulated, especially people in the coal industry, the ones that would get these injuries. Um, I mean, it just it, it, I just get pissed off when I think about how these people take advantage of them. The Sackler family, I, these people should burn in hell for what they did. Uh, totally agree. Totally agree. In, in fact, it, it, I, I really, really like that show because of how, uh, I mean, they name names, like you said, uh, uh the families that started that, uh, I was assigned uh, about eight years ago. I was assigned to be one of the attorneys from the state to go against the uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies here in West Virginia. We were one of the very first states to actually uh, go after the pharmaceutical uh, distributors. Everybody else was going after the pharmacist. And uh, the uh, the people that actually made it, but we went after the distributors, the people that were the middlemen, so to speak. I'm sorry, there's my neighbor's cutting grass. If that's interfering, I'll walk into the other room. Sorry about that. I don't even hear it. Can uh, don't, okay, don't worry. I can edit. I can edit a lot of stuff out, except Murph. I edit Murph out on a regular basis too. <laughs> so, did you shoot him? It sounded like a gunshot. Did you take I a shot, shot, shot at I him? I shut one of the doors here on my porch so that maybe maybe it'll block some of the uh, noise out of here. But Hey, we did that with Murph's partner. He was uh, – Murph and his partner were involved in a shooting, and we tried to reschedule Kevin a couple times. Finally said, like, screw it, man. We're just doing it, you know, whatever. So yeah. <laughs> our, our, our folks out there understand that uh, sometimes the conditions are, are optimal. But, yeah, yeah so it, it, like I said, so kind of taking that back, what were the big um, – types of drugs that you were dealing with back then? What is it? Marijuana, cocaine? What else was happening that you guys were focusing on? Yeah. Uh, at that time, probably, uh, y- you know, the pills were a big thing, but, you know, bikers were the big thing. So uh, what to call crack today was crystal, uh, or what we had back in those days that the bikers were bringing in was crystal and crystal meth. Uh, and that became a big thing. Uh, and, uh, you know, LSD had, had come in from the West coast, uh, and it was kind of curious to see things happen on the West coast. And then you see them develop on the East coast and then we'd get them. So we were always like three or four or five years behind what we would see on the West coast. So it was kind of easy to predict till Oxycontin came along. And then we were kind of the battleground for Oxycontin. But, uh, at that time, uh, uh, crystal meth and cocaine uh, began to surface. And then for some reason, I don't know, you guys are probably too young for this, but uh, quaaludes became no. a, a giant. <laughs> War 714 quaaludes, oh my golly. We, we took down a couple of labs that Thanks for that kind comment, but yes, we do remember quaaludes. <laughs> I was, uh, I well, I was, uh, I'm younger than you two, but I was at, I was a freshman in college, and we had the Atlanta rhythm section playing. And the first time I ever heard that word being used, he goes, "Hey, thank you guys for showing up." You know, blah blah. blah. He's going like this, and then he goes, "And for those of you on quaaludes, <laughs> rock on." <laughs> and I had to ask somebody, "What's a quaalude?" And he goes, "Do you want one?" I said, "Hell no!" But what's a quaalude? I I'd never heard that term before. I was a little, you know, innocent farm kid, man. Ludes, baby, ludes, ludes. So you started. So you you had all that stuff coming in. Um, the interesting part is with a couple of the cases we're going to talk about really had not, nothing to do with dope. I mean, so you're working UC. Did you, did, was it, when you started getting into these other cases we're going to talk about, was it because it was an opportunity and they needed an undercover or did you sh- start shifting your focus from doing things like that to things like corruption or other things like that? 
Yeah, you, you know, that's interesting because, like I said, our unit went through all kinds of growing pains. But uh, sometimes we just get a call and that, look, we have a problem in this area. And, you know, by then I'd been undercover four or five years and I was doing pretty good at it. Uh, so my name kind of got spread around within the state police that, you know, if you need somebody to come in UC to work on a case, give them a call. Uh, so, so we ended up working actually a variety of things. I mean, we ended up, we worked, um, uh, a case called spinners and it's where they take cars and, uh, before they, they had digital odometers where they could actually take it to a place oh, yeah. and, and, and turn the odometers back, you know, a hundred thousand miles. So you sell a car. Uh, I remember right in the middle of, of one of my big investigations, they said, hey, we need you to uh, go work a spinner case. Well, I'm thinking, hell, here's a new drug. I haven't, I haven't even heard of spinners before. And then they, <laughs> then they explained to me what it was. I said, well, okay. So, you know, you'd, you'd break and you'd go down and do that. Or they'd had the uh, same thing in the middle of one of our investigations. Uh, they had a nun that was raped and murdered up in Wheeling. And it was like six months old and they hadn't solved it yet. So, you know, they took me and a couple of the other guys up to work on that. So, so we worked a little bit of everything, but it was kind of surprising. I mean, except for like the, the nun murder, uh, in the spinner case, almost every other case that you had, whether it was organized or cri crime or not, always revolved back or evolved back into drugs. Uh, you know, that, that's how a lot of them funded their organizations. So that's what it always came back to. Now, between this, sorry, I just got attacked by my cat. As For those of you who are regular listeners, you know my one cat, Fanny, has a active stomach. When she gets hungry, she gets hungry and I get attacked. <laughs> She's just going to have to wait right now. But um, at what point, though, uh, in your career, did you start going back to school? Because we talked about that. So, you know, how long, how long into the state police did you decide, hey, I'm going to take advantage of this GI Bill and start going back to school? Yeah, I actually started that when I was in uniform down at Beckley. Like I said, I went to Beckley College. Uh, I finished up. I got a degree in art, of all things. Uh, Wait a minute. Hold on. Yeah. Really? Uh, Underwater art. basket yeah. weaving and art. Oh, okay. Yeah, art. art. Yeah. Well, no wonder you graduated magna so. cum laude. It was like introduction <laughs> to pottery throwing and basket now, wait weaving. A oh, you wait just a said minute. magnus I, again. I thought you were taking tough. like calculus and advanced statistics. What do you mean it was tough? I know. I did I, not I hated do that. Art. Man, I, that yeah. was, I hated that class. <laughs> but but uh, and then when I got that, uh, I still had my GI Bill left. So then I went to uh, Bluefield State and uh, and got a yeah I got a bachelor's in uh, criminal justice. And uh, you know that's that's when uh, so law school. Beckley was a kind of Beckley was a two year college then. Yes, at that time it was. Yeah. Okay, I'll give you. Okay, I'll cut you a little slack then. I thought that's what you got your 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 four year degree, and I'm going art, whatever. But it got no, you into the criminal no. justice degree. You're getting a little what? credibility back here now, Tom. Okay, thanks. What thanks. years did you go to Bluefield State? Because we were probably there at the same time. Well, uh, I would have been there in uh, probably seventy five and seventy six. I Maybe started in 75 after I flunked out of WVU. Yeah, <laughs> Dad I thought said, you I ain't paying for that crap, boy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was a little smart-ass punk back then, just uh, 18 years old. Well, look at this. But, you both uh, were at Bluefield State at the same time. Well, look, That's see, it. piece of history here. Now we have some yeah. crossover. I'm, yeah. It's amazing you guys didn't, for some reason, run into each other. Uh I'm sure we did, but if he was already a trooper. We, we probably married each other's cousins or something. They, Oh, we're all related. That's that's the beauty of our state. You know, well, that's the only, you know, people used to say that about Kansas. They said, no, it started from West Virginia. If I divorce my wife, is she still my sister? You know, we that's yeah. that's where that came from, not Kansas. It, it I want to be very you clear don't lose about family it. just because of a marital dispute. Come on now. Yeah. But you know what? If, if you were there at that time and people knew you were a trooper, Tom, that was, they were either wanting to kiss your butt because you were a trooper or, or they were more in awe that you were a trooper in college class with them. You know, especially us young kids. I mean, you guys, you guys were studs. Well, yeah, and I tell you, most of the time, especially as after I started working undercover and I, I kept going to college, uh, is, uh, you know, I tried not to tell people what it was I did because, you know, it just, it, it wasn't that cool at that point, you know, especially in, on the higher academic levels to be a police officer. As you know, a lot of police officers didn't go to college back in those days. Right. Uh, so, you know, it was kind of unusual, number one, to go. But, yeah. 
That was, uh, and that was one of the things that was, uh, because of that time period, was very unique to the Bluefield Police Department because only 35 officers, and I think over half had their, uh, at least a two-year degree and something like 20, I don't think 26 or 27 out of 35 were working towards their four-year degree, you know, and they, and they created a uh, college incentive package that you got a dollar per hour of college credit you got the extra, you know, that extra money per month, which doesn't sound like much. If you had your degree, you got $128 a month, but when you're only making $800 a month, right. that's a hell of a lot of money. That's a nice little bump. Only to spend $300 a month in a student loan payment. That was smart. Yeah. Back there. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had the, we had the leap program back then. So you could get them to pay for your college and you had to promise to give two years of law enforcement experience for every semester that they paid for your, uh, paid for your uh, tuition. So it worked out. Who were some of the teachers you had back then? This is like old home week. Oh, Lord, I, I don't know. I'm trying to think of the, the main instructor I had at Bluefield because he's actually the guy that he didn't talk me into going to law school. I lost a bet is how I ended up in law school. Oh. But, but <laughs> was his he name was Gary a, Willis? Uh, did he used to be? Had a beard? Uh, uh, yeah, had a beard. He was a, it used to be a, uh, I think not an Indiana trooper, but I think he was a police officer in, in Indiana somewhere before he went to Bluefield. Yeah. I, I don't, don't remember. It's, it's been so long. Anyway. It's hard to remember those names. Bill Alden was a Bluefield cop that ended up being a professor over there. Yeah. Yeah. I knew him. Aldridge. Yeah. Bill Aldridge. Bill Aldridge. Yeah. I, yeah. This feels like the fucking Lawrence Welk hour now. I'm now no, next sorry. thing I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, you know what? Aldridge told me, he said, when I came on the police department, because I was the first student at Bluefield State to go through their internship program because I didn't have a job in the summer. So I did the PD for five weeks and I did the Merce County SO for five weeks. And when I got hired on the Bluefield Police Department in, in November 75, Aldridge was one of the first guys that came up to him and he's like, boy, You've got a lot more in your life than being a police officer. You need to go get a real job. <laughs> and and we, my partner Javier and I got to speak at uh, at Bluefield State oh, probably six or seven years ago. And Bill came up and introduced us. And he recalled that story about telling me, I told this guy, get the hell out of police work. But look what he did. <laughs> he didn't listen to shit. <laughs> Okay, enough of, enough of the uh, uh, nostalgia so here. Let us now start working into, we actually, we talked about a couple cases we wanted to talk about, and both of these are very interesting. Both of them involve you working undercover, and one of them we're going to talk about uh, involved you working with uh, who is now currently your boss that I think you or met was. when you were working on the, yeah, or was working on the DEA task force. So the first one we want to talk about is Larry Minks and Carl Lee Gallo. So uh, that's that sounds like a good southern name, Carl Lee Gallo. This sounds like something out of my cousin Vinny, you know. Oh, um, it, it does. <laughs> it was. So uh, let, let's start setting context for this case. So just give us the bookends first. Like, what was the case about, and then start telling us how you initially got involved in this. Because one of the guys you talked about reminds me of John Gotti, the Teflon Don. It's like you couldn't touch this guy for a long time. And that's exactly the way it was. I actually had heard being from Fairmont, uh, Carly was a small community, uh, on the other side of the river from Clarksburg, West Virginia. And, uh, I'd heard his name going through the Academy, things like that. Uh, and, uh, I get a call from one of the heroes in the state police, uh, that, uh, uh, that, I had actually heard about way before I got to the state police. His name's uh, 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 Joe Trupo. And, uh, oh, yeah. I remember yeah, that name. We, like I said, he, he was uh, an icon in the state police. And But anyway, he gave me a call one day, and he said, hey, Kirk. Uh, he said, come meet me. So, you know, him being a, a captain, I think I was a corporal at the time. I said, yes, sir. So I drove up there, and he said, look, I've been hearing your name a lot. And I'd like to uh, uh, offer you a uh, case up here. And I said, yes, sir. What do you need? And, and he said, we've got this guy that has been arrested like 50 times. Uh, he's, to my knowledge, never spent a night in jail. He's never been indicted. Uh, he always, somehow he always gets to the jurors, uh, whether it's through his name or intimidation. He said, and he's, he started naming a lot of a lot of the things that he'd heard that he'd done and that he knew that he'd done. And he said, we can't get close to him. He said, we've got some of the local police or his relatives up here. 
So, uh, you know, we can't even get an undercover guy near him without him knowing about it. He said, could you come up here and help me with him? And I said, absolutely. Hey, players, that is the end of part one. Part two, as always, comes out on Thursday. In the meantime, check us out at Game of Crimes on Twitter, at Game of Crimes Podcast on Facebook, at the Instagram. But where you got to be, where you got to be, where you got to be, got to be on Patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. We have a ton of good stuff, including if you are at the right level, Guardian of the Realm and Warden of the Throne, we have just released part one, episode one of The Real DEA Narcos, talking about The Real DEA Narcos, Cali Edition, Chris Feistel and Dave Mitchell, Go in-depth, 16 hours, about how they took down the Cali cartel. Information you will not hear anywhere else in the world, not on Netflix, not anywhere, not in a book, only right here on Game of Crimes at patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. In the meantime, also go check out our webpage, gameofcrimespodcast.com. We've got the latest merch, pictures for every episode that we put up, books that our guests write. We only put up books that they write. We put them up there. So we thank you once again for being a player in the biggest, baddest, most dangerous game of all, the... Game of Crimes.